Thanks very much indeed. Um, thank you to Teresa and also to Roger for having me here. Um, this is the, the, the subtitle theme is political lies and their consequences. And it seems to me talking about you know why lies are a bad thing is, is quite easy. But I think the really difficult question, the really difficult question is asking what are the consequences of not lying? Because in the political environment is one where your opponents are not always necessarily always going to tell the truth. They're not always going to conform to the high standards of rational debate and honesty that we might want. So can anybody afford to not tell lies? So the, the challenge here was put really well in uh, primary colours, you know, which is a fictionalised account of Bill Clinton's first presidential campaign. And in the film version, at the very end, the president character is saying to a disillusioned, idealistic young activist, you know, this is hardball. This is the price you pay to lead. You don't think Lincoln was a whore before he was president? He had to tell his stories and smile his backcountry grin. He did that so one day he'd have the opportunity to stand before the nation and appeal to our better nature. That's where the bullshit stops. It's a very powerful film. I think it's a very interesting film a lot of, and book as well. People thought it was a terrible expose of how degraded and morally reprehensible politics had become. But I think it was more subtle than that. It was actually showing that there is a genuine dilemma for people who want to achieve progressive change, which is how much can you do that by behaving with complete purity? How much do you have to you know, keep your hands clean or get your hands dirty? Now, the way in which this debate is usually framed is it's seen as a kind of competition or balance between pragmatism and principle. But I think that's kind of mistaken because it makes it sound as though pragmatism and principle are separate things. I think there's a much more intimate relationship between pragmatism and principle. You know, because political action, political activity is concerned with concrete outcomes. It's concerned with the pragmatics, what actually happens. And the principles relate to outcomes. So whenever your principles relate to outcomes, there can be no neat distinction between principles and practice. So, for example, if I have to choose between, I don't know, some kind of deception or lie or managing to do something in the political sphere which is going to make people's lives better, that's not a fight between principles and pragmatism. It's a fight between principles concerning my personal integrity and lying and principles concerning social justice. It's not a, it's not, so it's, it's a battle between two sets of principles, not principles and practice. And I think if we sort of start to think too much as, of principle as being something which has nothing to do with outcomes, you end up with the absurdity, the famous quote attributed to Ferdinand I, you know, let justice be done, though the whole world perish. There can be no justice in which a whole world um, perishes. So it's a, it's a difficult debate. It's not something that you can just, you know, make ourselves feel good about. We have to avoid what the British philosopher Bernard Williams called moral self-indulgence. Uh, this is what we do when... We, 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 we act in a way which makes us feel good about ourselves because we're honest and pure, but actually that has harmful consequences and the price of our own purity is a world which is not as good. Now, when it comes to lying, you might accept the fact that nobody can be completely 
you know, whiter than white in politics or in life. But you can still say, look, there is a difference between what's been called you know, economy with the truth and actual lying. And actually, people expect this. Nobody expects everyone to simply say exactly what they think as bluntly as possible at, on all occasions. We, we expect people and we understand people to have a certain in economy with the truth, we might say. But that concession to lack of purity doesn't really get us very far because actually there is an important distinction that people make. It's not between lies and not telling the whole truth. It's between truthful sincerity and deception. And when you cross that line, people do care about it and it's no longer simple, straightforward, acceptable. So a classic example maybe was this, you know. You may remember Bill Clinton saying, looking the American people in the eye and saying, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Well, you know, a lot of people say that actually, actually, given the precise meaning of sexual relations in Arkansas of Bill Clinton's time, he was kind of technically correct, right? That somehow what Monica Lewinsky did um, with him or to him, depending on how you uh, look at it, was not as would be understood in Arkansas sexual relations. But of course that doesn't satisfy anyone. No one thinks, oh, okay, so he was being honest, no problem. We see that what he said was intended to deceive and that wasn't good enough. So I don't think there's a, a straightforward way of holding on to a principle of purity. So we have to confront the issue to what extent are lies permissible or not. And what's the argument against them? Now, I think there are lots of arguments that you could have why deception in politics in particular is problematic and why truthfulness matters. But what I want to focus on is a specific set of reasons. And I want to argue that truthfulness matters largely because it's impossible to have a reasoned, rational, political discourse in its absence. Now, why is that important? Actually, I'll tell you why it's important, hopefully, as we go on. But Michael's presentation made me think of this. and It's a shame he's not here. I'm sure Michael Shermer would agree that the progress he describes is not inevitable and it's not irreversible. It happened for particular reasons. And in fact, you know, in his book, he argues it's to do with reason and science. So if that's what enabled this progress to happen, then presumably, if we don't defend that rational sphere, there's no reason to think the progress will continue. And we might even worry it will get reversed. Because there can be no room for complacency about progress when, for example, Britain has left the EU is voted to leave the EU. That is not progress for me. Marine Le Pen could become president of France. That's not progress. And Donald Trump, on most recent opinion polls, is worryingly close to being president of the most powerful nation on the, in the world. These are not aspects of progress. And I think that there are reasons why these negative developments have occurred. And a lot of them are to do with a decline in the power of reasoned rational debate in the political sphere. Um, if you look all around the Western world, in Europe as well, you can, you can see this uh, quite strongly. There's uh, a, a kind of decline of any, any kind of real interest in the mainstream political debate about what's rational and what is true. There's a lack of even care about it. Um, for example, in the, the EU referendum, in Britain, the Remain campaign campaigned a lot on the basis of facts. It tried to give evidence and data about what it would mean to leave the EU and so forth. But these arguments had no effect. The arguments that had effect were the emotion, emotional ones around people taking control. This was the phrase. People thought they wanted Britain to take back control of, its, of itself and not be in control from Europe. Trump as well. I mean, I don't believe most American voters don't see that a lot of what Trump says is factually incorrect and rationally ridiculous, but they just don't care about that. 
what they want is just the emotive message. We're going to make America great again. And I think one of the biggest signs of this disregard for reasonableness in the political sphere was when a, a government minister during the EU referendum campaign in Britain said, people in this country have had enough of experts, right? It's like we don't have to worry about what the people who really understand things think. We can just decide for ourselves, from our, from our guts and from our hearts. So I want to argue that we need to have a more rational public debate, but you need to ask why. It's easy to stand here and say, oh, reason, rationality, evidence are good things. You know, we need to make a case for why that is necessary. Because, you know, maybe, maybe it isn't. Maybe the best way to get things done is to basically, you know, to talk emotionally, irrationally, and then just get into power and try and do the right things, okay? We don't necessarily need, the argument might be, a more rational public a political discourse in order to get the right people into government to do the rational things. Okay? And, this is, and you could even say this is a kind of an elitist intellectual kind of fantasy that people who themselves are interested in reason and rationality and, and academics and everything, you know, they want to think that that's very, very important for the political debate. But actually, that's, that's kind of wrong. What matters is getting people out to vote for you, and then you get on with it. So you can have a kind of double speak. So there can be, in principle, a distinction between a political rhetoric, which is not rational and reasoned, and a political substance, which is. Now, we have to distinguish, though, between two possible ways in which this might be true. The one is where there's actually a, a complete mismatch between the what's said and what is done, okay? So one way is you just tell people what they want to hear and then you do what you want to do. Now, I think the problem with that is it's, apart from the moral objections, that's practically unsustainable. No one could get elected more than once by doing that. So that kind of strict distinction doesn't work. The more possible version is you need to sort of have a different kind of discourse, one which is not contradictory to the rational one, but one which puts it into different terms. Uh, the former governor of New York, Michael Cuomo, put this famously when he said, you campaign in poetry, you govern in prose. Okay? And there are also versions of this in theology. Some people say, you know, in religion, the stories and the myths, they're for the simple people to understand, and the theologians understand the, the better the real difficult stuff, but you, you don't, there's no contradiction between the two, but you just need to speak differently to different people. So that would, and I think Barack Obama's campaign, you know, yes we can, in a way, kind of fits this kind of template, doesn't it? Because on the one hand, it's just a very simple message, but it doesn't contradict, it doesn't contradict what, he, what he's going to do. He did believe, yes we can, but, you know, there's no need to talk about all the complications. Just say to people, yes, we can, and then we'll worry about the, the um, practicalities later. So this would seem to point to a way of doing politics which doesn't involve a commitment to public rational discourse, but it doesn't seem to require any kind of deception either. Now, in lots of ways, this seems like the obvious route to follow. Uh, it is, in fact, what goes on most of the time. There's no political group ever who have not to some extent tried to kind of you know, fashion messages which are emotive and appealing, uh, which are not themselves asking people to engage with the difficult rational issues and factual issues. So it might seem fine, it might seem reasonable, but if you think about it, what I've just described is really just a definition of something called spin. Now, spin does not have a very good reputation at the moment. Now, and why is that? Why has spin become a dirty word? Well, I think the reason is because there's this tension here. The distinction between a rhetoric which departs from the substance and a rhetoric which simply presents the substance differently is not a neat one. And it's always possible that one thing can become the other. So here's my um, slightly 
um, uh, an, an analogous example. So, you know, you can have, you can represent somebody badly, right? This is a f uh, famous picture coming up here of uh, David Cameron, former prime minister on the beach. Uh, but that did, didn't make him look good, right? That's a kind of like a bad representation. And then you can have like a good representation, right? And that's not lying. It's simply showing him at his best, right? But, you know, then you can have a kind of fantastical representation, a misrepresentation of the other kind that shows the person um, in a completely false light. Now, the problem is that you've got here, you know, misrepresentation of two different kinds, negative and positives, and a best representation. And, of course, you know, there's, there's a continuum between those things. And the problem is, in politics, is that benign spin, benign spin being the attempt to simply present the truth, but in a way which makes it most attractive, um, is very easily and often, in fact, degenerates into a malign form of deception, a kind of form of lying. And that happens when your spin leads people to draw conclusions which are actually false in some way. And in a way, that is kind of a lot of the time what spin is trying to do. It's not simply trying to make, uh, it present the truth of your position in the best possible light. It almost inevitably ends up becoming about inviting people to draw slightly wrong conclusions. Think your policies are going to achieve you know, more than they actually will. You know, get them to think that the opponent's position is more malicious than it is, and so forth. So I think that actually, when you think about this idea of just simply good presentation, it's very difficult to get the balance right without it degenerating into something dishonest. But I think perhaps even more important here is the reason why in so many countries people have... Uh, disliked spin is that actually it's encouraged them to have a kind of scepticism where they don't think truth is actually important to what's being said to them. When an electorate believes that every message they get is a spun message, then they no longer kind of think that it's important or necessary to, to think of these statements as being true or false. They think this is, they're just saying what they need to say that the people who spin are only interested in the effects of what is being said, not in uh, the content of it. So a culture of spin makes the categories of truth and lies irrelevant. And I think that that has, is something that has happened in the politics. I, I, obviously, I know Britain more. You tell me if it's the same in a country like Spain and in a region like <laughs> Catalonia. Um, the concept of truth is something that there, there's such scepticism. It's not so much that the public believe people are lying. It's that they don't believe political discourse has anything to do with the truth. Okay? So an example, again, in the EU referendum, there was a claim made by people campaigning to leave, which was that it would save Britain £350 million every week which would be spent on schools and hospitals, okay? Now, not only was that figure of 350 million obviously and clearly and demonstrably false, the referendum campaign was not a campaign to form a government. So there was no, no one could promise what any saved money would be used for. Now, it was widely reported that this figure was wrong. So were the British public simply stupid? Did they not see through the lie? Yeah. I think it's that they didn't really care. They didn't think the debate was one in which what really mattered was who was telling the truth or not. They thought what mattered in the debate is what kind of direction people were pointing us towards, what kind of things they were appealing to about what we wanted. And it was the broad intention, nothing to do with the details. And of course... Politics is all about detail, and getting things right is all about detail. So, apparently benign spin, I think, is problematic. It can lead people, um, first of all, what we think of as simply presenting the truth in the most favourable light easily degenerates into distorting the truth. And secondly, it actually leads people to think that truth is no longer the important factor. 
And that's one reason why a lot of people now talk of us living in a case of a, a post-truth society, a post-truth politics. So there are clearly problems around this, but I want to, for the sort of second part of what I want to talk about, flip it around. Because I think I can make a case, uh, you can try and make a case against political deception. You can make a case for a more rational politics. And I think I've done a little bit of that, but, and, but it would seem that these two things are separate. And I haven't shown, of course, it's inevitable that uh, a focus on best representation will always degenerate into misrepresentation. So I think if you're interested, as I am, in, in promoting a more rational political discourse, you have to make a strong positive case for it. And that's what I want to try and do. Now, I think I'm going to just offer three reasons why we ought to be trying to promote a more rational political debate. Now, the first, the first reason is simply that, as I say, reason matters. It's not obvious. It's that I think most of us, when we sit down and think about it, will think that a rational discussion, rational argument, debate, evidence and experiment simply are the best ways of arriving at the best solutions. Now, if you think that's the case, it seems to me important to promote the valuing of reason debate in the public sphere. And the problem is here is, one reason why that's so hard is it's simply not difficult to make good rational cases. It's not difficult to understand them either. You know, human beings actually respond more easily to the non-rational and the emotional automatic responses than we do to a rational case. So I think in politics, people have recognized that it's hard to make cases, so they retreat from them. But this is a case of, of, of a vicious spiral. Avoid difficult rational arguments because they appear difficult. That means we make less of them, which means people are less familiar with that kind of thing. It means that when they do appear, they appear even more difficult. And there's this slow retreat of the rational. So I think that... You, you need to, and, and the other reason why I think it's important for progressive politics in particular to value reason is that there is always a tension. There's a tension in progressive politics. The tension is that if you want to win and you want to get into power, you have to appeal to what people find agreeable. But if you want to change the direction of society, you often have to make a case for what people do not currently agree with. So there's this tension between appealing to what people already find agreeable and changing their perception of what is agreeable and what is right. A balancing act between following and shaping the popular will. And I think that if we don't allow ourselves the tool of reason and rational debate to achieve that shaping, then we end up in a situation where we actually can no longer shape the direction of society, we have to simply respond to what people find appealing, and that is not progressive. So we, haven't, we had an example of this, I think, recently in Britain, where the then opposition Labour government made a promise that it wanted to freeze energy prices if it got into power. Okay? This sounds good. Yeah, what, how, who could disagree with this? Every analyst agreed this was, if you're interested in greater social justice, if you're interested in helping the poor, this was not an efficient use of resources. But what happened is a party, a politics which lost faith in its ability to argue for what really was the best thing, simply had to offer something worse instead because it thought that was the only way in which you could get into power. So the, when you allow... Uh, the political discourse to uh, become light on reason, for reason not to be in its place, I think you create huge difficulties because you, you really do need uh, reason and argument to both determine what is right and also to um, make the case to people and change their minds. And linked to that, the second reason I focus on here is that if you give up on base, if, you, if you keep all the reasoning in private, behind closed doors, and you simply try and make the case to the people by using just tools of persuasion and don't really worry about uh, rational argument, then I think you're ultimately going to lose. 
because actually the most persuasive arguments are those ones which are more intuitively appealing and simplistic. So if you f fight the political battle simply on persuasion and you try and keep out the rational, you're going to lose. And I think that's another reason why we see a lot of the kind of bad populist politics becoming so powerful in, in the West. You have parties which combine a simplicity of message with an apparent sincerity of intent. P people respond to that. The mainstream parties, on the whole, are seen as untrustworthy, and they, if they try and insist that actually matters are more complex, then that's just seen to be a dishonest tactic to try and protect their own elite status. I think the third reason why more reasoned politics is vital is, an, is a neglected one. It's that reasoned argument, I think, is at the very basis of what I'm calling pluralist democracy. Much more than government just following the will of the people. People say democracy is wonderful. And what is democracy? People say democracy is government which follows the will of the people. I think that's kind of right and wrong. That is a, one definition of democracy. It's a form of democracy that people like Plato and Aristotle completely rejected. And a lot of the time, now I think we think, yes, Plato and Aristotle, the problem is they were products of their time, they were elitists. The reason they rejected democracy was simply because of the prejudices of their time. Like everyone is subject to prejudices. But I disagree. I think if I focus on Aristotle, Aristotle had two very good reasons for opposing democracy, and they are still very good reasons. The first one is that it is absurd to believe that the best way to govern can be determined simply by consulting a random group of people and asking for their opinions. And the second reason he thought democracy was terrible was that it would be unjust for a majority to impose its will on a minority. Okay? Those are two very strong arguments against democracy. And yet we have successful democracies. Why is that? Well, it's because our successful democracies are not de the kind of democracies that Plato and Aristotle imagined. They weren't simply about consulting the people, getting their opinion, putting it into power. The successful forms of democracy, and I call them pluralist democracies we have in the West, have three features which are additional to the simple conducting of elections, and they're essential. The first is that there's an assumption, a very deep assumption in all Western democracies, that whoever wins an election governs for all, not just those who are elected them. And that's an assumption which I think is under threat. And you see it very obviously under threat in America, where you've got someone like Donald Trump saying before the election that he's not necessarily prepared to accept the result, and the American people shouldn't either, right? This is, this is a really deep problem. Now, if, 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 if a democracy is simply... Uh, that, well, what that sh shows you is something about the polarisation. The election there is seen as a winner-takes-all battle, right? And that's deeply problematic. A second feature is rule of law. Now, again, Aristotle thought the problem with um, democracy is there would be no rule of law because a new leader comes in, the majority simply change all the rules and so there's no meaning to the rule of law. Rule of law assumes that the more fundamental aspects of our constitutions aren't changed simply by a change of government. They have to have a, there has to be more of a sign of a more settled and large majority in favour of them. And the third feature our democracies have, which is that they do not give direct decision-making powers to the electorate. It's representative democracy. We elect, you elect someone like Teresa, right? And you don't instruct her as a delegate to go out and do X, Y, and Z, but you charge her with the responsibility of deciding what particular things to support and not support based upon a set of priorities which are, you've agreed upon beforehand. You know the kind of values she has, you know the kind of outcome she wants, but you don't then mandate precisely how she should vote on every single policy, you leave it to her. Now you put these three factors together and what you can really see is that they have something in common. 
which is successful pluralist democracy depend upon negotiation and compromise, not winner takes all, but people coming together, um, you know, balancing interests, respecting rule of law, and so forth. In other words, and that essentially requires a space of reasoned and balanced debate. And so in that sense, rational discussion, I would say, both embodies and models the core values of pluralist democracy. And so every time we turn our backs on rational debate, when rely on lies, deception, manipulation or spin, you're undermining the core values on which democracies depend. So I think that's really, for me, one of the main reasons why a space of reason debate, a very important space of reason debate, is required. Um, now, I think that means... For me, that makes it quite clear what the case for rational discourse is. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that there's no room at all for the arts of persuasion. Okay? I mean, that would be completely ridiculous to think that we don't have to think at all about why it is that some forms of argument are more persuasive than others. I think we need to understand how it works from a point of view of psychology more than anything. Um, and then we need to, where necessary, I think, expose them. Now, this is interesting, of course, because the problem is when everybody is engaged with using techniques of persuasion, irrespective of their rational, reasonable validity, nobody has the moral authority to turn around and complain when other people are doing it. So I think, yeah, it may seem a brave thing to do, but I think that uh, what a progressive political movement should do is to refuse to use what we might call devious techniques of persuasion. And only when that is actually happening can you then point out when others are doing it and expose the techniques they're using to tell the public about them. Now, some people might not think the public is smart enough to be able to understand this. I think if you have that scepticism, if you allow your scepticism about the capacity for the public to understand a reasonable argument to go so far, in a way, what you've done is you've given up on the people that you're hoping to represent, in a way. Yeah? If you become so cynical that you believe deceptive manipulation is the only route to power, you know, what, what is your sort of love for humanity and your fellow human beings driving you at all? But we, we do need to understand the techniques, and we should use them selectively sometimes, as long as they are not contrary to and they are in service to the truth. To give you a little example, it's a well-known finding that repeating any claim, even to say that claim is false, merely encourages people to believe it. So, for example, if, if, if it's widely believed that immigrants are largely responsible for unemployment among you know, the native population, then saying it's not true that immigrants are largely responsible for unemployment actually has the effect of making people think it's truer. It seems odd, but the way the human mind works is it's like the no smoke without fire principle. The, the more people hear something being said, the more they assume there's some truth in it. But you can understand that, and you can use it, not by promoting an opposite lie, but by trying to realising that, first of all, you don't counter those myths by simply denying them. You counter them by repeating yourself a contradictory but positive message, which might be, for example, the case that, you know, whatever, 90% of the jobs created in the last year were taken uh, by um, you know, not, uh, Spanish, native Spanish citizens or something. I don't know what the statistics are. But what you do is, rather than you counter the negative fact by saying the negative fact isn't true, you simply keep bashing away at a true positive fact, and that's the way to do it. I mean, that's just a small example of how, if you understand the techniques of persuasion, you can use some of them at all. And of course, persuasion is not a dirty word. All rational argument, I think, is in some sense an attempt at persuasion, because to believe something is true is to believe that people ought to believe it, rather than some other falsehood. So look, I just want to, I need to finish, but I just want to finish up by going back to our old friend Aristotle. Aristotle 
promoted rhetoric. I don't know. I don't know how rhetoric is understood as a word in popular culture in in in, in here in Catalonia and in Spain. In Britain, rhetoric is often used as a kind of negative word. Rhetoric is seen as being good speaking but lacking in substance. That's not the way the ancient Greeks saw it. The, 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 the ancient Greeks thought rhetoric was an art and it had three elements. Good rhetoric was required ethos, character. So you have to believe in the integrity of the person speaking. Pathos, emotion, they fully understood. It's not a discovery of psychology that emotion is important to persuasion. The ancient Greeks realized that too. And the third one is logos, which is reason. Now, I think, as a matter of fact, today, what passes for political rhetoric is actually entirely dominated by pathos, emotion, in the broad sense. In the broad sense, meaning that it's what makes people feel different, not what asks them to engage their intellects. And I think that, really, if we want to talk about persuasion, we want to counter lies. We need to appreciate that rhetoric actually involves all three of these things and that therefore it's not a choice between appealing to people's hearts and appealing to people's minds because good rhetoric always does both and the reason why good rhetoric always does both is because that's the way we're constituted we are not Descartesian uh, you know minds in bodies we are Bodies and minds. So, actually, I'm going to leave you with a... I, I hope this is the Japanese character for Kokoro. If anyone speaks Japanese, they might be wrong. Um, there's heart-mind. The Japanese have this concept, Kokoro, heart-mind. And it's a very useful idea because it's something which doesn't distinguish between the two. That, I think, is, is what we ought to be aiming for in, 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 in what we're, we're doing. So, just to sum up, I think we need to give reason discussion a central role in politics because firstly it's only by the use of reason we can come up with good practical policies secondly because progressives cannot win the political battle fought using merely tools of persuasion without any rational backup and thirdly because reason is central to the functioning of a pluralist democracy to protect that rational domain it's not enough to avoid lies and deception but also to avoid that kind of spin that by putting presentation first undermines any confidence that truth or rationality are valued by those making their case. And I think that refusing to use devious techniques and lies can to be turned to our advantage because it allows us to expose how others are relying on them. And nor does it require us to just have no interest at all in what is persuasive. Our challenge is to marry the emotive power of words with the rational power of argument in the kind of rhetoric championed by Aristotle, to marry head and heart, reason and passion. Thank you.